you would turn in your Bibles this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we will be reading from verse 18 through verse 25, really considering Paul's exhortation for a very divisive church, a church that was really struggling, serious division. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is the holy and inspired word of God. Let us listen with reverence and with awe. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's pray. Lord our God, in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son, we come before your majestic throne to petition your blessing upon our time in your word. We ask that we would be edified, that we would be encouraged and strengthened to cling to none other than Christ himself. By your Spirit, keep our minds focused and nourished, for we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, by the help of his Spirit. Amen. In the 2006 film, V for Vendetta, the main character V seeks to open the eyes of the British populace by exposing the corruption and the villainy of their government. He seeks to offer them salvation really by opening their eyes with his words. And he does so most prominently on national television where he declares, words will always retain their power. Words offer the means to meaning and for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. He introduces, he introduces himself to another character with the power of words. <clears throat> Voila, in view a humble vaudevillian veteran cast vicariously as both victim and villain by the vicissitudes of fate. This visage, no mere veneer of vanity, is a vestige of a vox populi now vacant, vanished. However, this val valorous visitation of a bygone vexation stands vivified and has vowed to vanquish these venal and virulent vermin, vanguarding vice and vouchsafing the violently vicious and voracious violation of volition. The only verdict is vengeance, a vendetta held as a votive, not in vain, for the value and veracity of such shall one day vindicate the vigilant and the virtuous. Verily, this vicious soise of verbiage veers most verbose. Isn't that just a wonderfully eloquent and wise speech? I don't think that most of us even understand the words that he used or what he said. Crazy as it may sound, V's intention in his style is very similar to the setting for which Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church. We could say that V, V is his name, we could say that V's speech is filled with much wisdom. And in Corinth there was value for speeches like these. But in our text today, Paul asserts something quite different. That such wisdom like V's and such rhetorical excellence like V's is not only contrary to the message of the cross, but ineffective to save. Rather, Paul roots the effectiveness of the gospel message of salvation not in the wisdom of rhetorical excellence or the wisdom of the spe speaker, but in God's might and in God's wisdom to, to save, which far surpasses the wisdom and the power of men. And we'll look at this in three ways. First, the work of God in verse 18 to 21. Second, the method of man in verse 22 to 24. And third, the supremacy of God in verse 25. Work of God, method of man, the supremacy of God. So first, the work of God. Now, I think it might be helpful to look at the historical setting of Corinth as we consider this text. So Corinth was a city not, like the major, not unlike the major cities of our days, uh, the places where commer commerce and culture were bo booming, often due to their location, is very similar uh, for Corinth as it is in our own day. They were geographically one of the keys to trade throughout the Roman Empire and beyond, and as such, the city was flourishing. 
The Corinthians were a people who were steeped in a rich culture that most notably valued the power of orators to craft speeches filled with genius, intelligence, wisdom, and power, and most of all, gave those to the people to whom they spoke. It was the combination of both their eloquence in speech along with their wisdom, that is, both a religious and philosophically enlightening ideas that made these orders so popular. So those two things, their eloquence in speech and their wisdom in religious and philosophical matters. And so celebrity, uh, celebrity speakers had become quite popular who had earned their fame and gathered a cult-like following. And that was their goal, really, to, ga to gather and to gain such a following through these speeches. That was their calling. That was their vocation. So their purpose was to move the populace also, to equip the public with the wisdom that they needed to ascend to higher and better life situations. They tickled their audience's ears with their ideas. And it was through orders like this that the most popular religious philosophies like Stoicism, Epicureanism, Platonism, and so on were able to gain such traction and capture Greco-Roman minds. But as you can imagine, the value of rhetorical, the, this value of rhetorical excellence and wisdom was problematic for Paul. He was stepping into a culture that had a rich and academic culture for public speakers to come and seduce the masses with their wisdom and speaking capabilities. It pretty much meant that in order for his testimony about Christ to be valued and heard and considered by the listeners, it had to conform to the nature that, uh, of, of orders that they were used to. That is their rhetoric and their wisdom. That it was plausible to them. And this is what Paul says a few verses later. It supports this notion. Excuse me, a few verses prior. He indicates that Chloe's report to Paul shows that there was a celebrity culture developing around certain leaders in the church. Certain preachers and leaders in the Corinthian church were almost certainly preaching with wisdom and with eloquence, and possibly even, I think we can suggest, changing the nature of the gospel to soothe the ears of their audience. And this means that Paul has serious competition because he does not preach like them. His authority as, a, as an apostle is being undermined because he does not preach to them in this way. He doesn't tell them what they want to hear, and he doesn't tell them the way that they want to hear it. And this is very clearly indicated in chapter 2, verse 1. He writes there, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so you'll notice then that the first four chapters of this book, four chapters of a letter that Paul writes to a church are spent defending his ministry and the nature of the gospel. He has to do this so that they actually have reason to listen to him when he addresses the other issues that he knows that they're having and has been reported to him. If he doesn't address their reason and establish a reason for them to listen to him, Despite the differences he brings as a speaker in the difference in the content of his message, there's no reason that the Corinthian church would read his letter and submit to his authority. Now, whether or not this, uh, what they were doing meant they were changing the gospel message itself, we can't be sure. However, I believe that given what Paul addresses later on in this letter, it would seem that that's the case. We see this, I think, most notably in, the, in really the, the pinnacle of this book in chapter 15, where it's indicated that they wanted glory and wisdom and power right now in the present. They thought that the new kingdoms had been ushered in, that they were in resurrected bodies. So the gospel message itself, along with its style, the way that it would preach, it seemed, began to conform to this. They did not realize that they were still in bodies of dust. They misunderstood the age that we, were in, we are in. They wanted the gospel message to conform to the glory and the wisdom that they were accustomed to. 
But Paul did not imbue his gospel message with the wisdom of the world, nor, nor did he utilize the literary and rhetorical functions common to these speakers and these orders. His words didn't drip honey or the power of the age to come that they believed had arrived. And so it stupefied them. His style here, even in this portion of the text in the Greek, affirms this. It's short. It's staccato. It's to the point. It doesn't tickle ears. It doesn't exalt himself or his content or his style so that he might gather a following. It's quick, to the point, undressed in rhetorical style. So his message and his perspective was unlike the Corinthian Christians who were allowing their perspective to be influenced by their culture. And the effect of this style of preaching and the message like they were developing is what Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 17. It emptied the cross of Christ of its power. But such a message is contrary to the gospel because no human being should have a reason to boast in the presence of God. The reason we believe should not be that the gospel was presented in such an alluring way and that we were in ourselves able to perceive the wisdom and the truth of it. We shouldn't be able to say, I, I, I analyzed the rational plausibility of, of his argument and, and I concluded that, you know, I think it's true. It's not like those who, who V spoke to who were willing to listen and believe the truth presented in his wise and crafty words. Hence, in this dynamic, we realize there's an issue with V's speech. He assumes, he assumes that people are able on their own to understand the message that he presents and that it's desirable to them, that they can perceive the wisdom of his words. And so Paul is arguing that he intentionally preaches in such a way that what is prominent is not the wisdom of a speaker or his rhetorical dexterity and skill, but the word itself, the content. And he does this in order that what's elevated and what's prominent is the content, the message. The speaker should be invisible. The speaker should not matter. The content should. I was reminded as I studied this text of the words of Ed Clowney, one of the former presidents of the seminary that I attend. He said, the goal of the minister is to preach Christ and to be forgotten. Nobody should have a reason to boast, not the speaker, nor those listening who might endeavor to claim responsibility for having eyes to see and ears to hear. So we've established then that their rhetoric creates a problem for God's design for how people come to faith. But there lies another problem. It's not just the rhetorical excellence in speakers that Corinthians are having problems with. It's the inherent content of that message. What's illustrated here is that the word itself about the cross produces two different outcomes. In verse 18, on the one hand, the, mess, the base message of the gospel, the word about the cross to one group, is folly. That group is those who will perish. On the other hand, to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And notice here that both groups are described as passive agents in response to this message and its content. It's not those who are choosing destruction to which it is folly. It's not those who are choosing salvation to which it is the power of God. But the ultimate destinies are determined by the content of the message. That's the active agent. They're passively responding. So there seems to be a paradox then. How can the same message evoke two different, two different responses? Well, Paul answers this question with a quotation of Isaiah 29, 14. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Here's the massive point in this. When all other worldly systems fail, God alone is mighty to save. God alone and the content of his message is mighty to save. When Assyria was pounding at the gates of Israel, threatening ultimate destruction, Jerusalem and her counselors reasoned that deliverance could be found in their allies to the south in Egypt. But there was no deliverance to be found through Egypt from Assyria. The Assyrians fire off to Judah when they, come and storm the, when they come and stand outside the city gates to lay siege. 
Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are now trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. So here Assyria mocks Hezekiah, the king of, uh, the king of Ju uh, Judah. And Hezekiah's response to this is to pray. Against all worldly wisdom, when all his counselors, when everybody else was telling him to go and to seek help from Egypt, that maybe they could pit Assyria and Egypt against one another, he sat down and he prayed. Thus the Lord delivers them, and he strikes down 185,000 men of Assyria. So, they, so then, as, Isaiah's, as, as Paul's quotation of Isaiah shows, God destroyed the wisdom of the wise. Egypt was helpless to help Judah, but God's power was mighty to save. And so Paul quotes Isaiah again, this time from chapter 19, verse 12. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So for all their wisdom, for all their cunning, for all their craft, Judah could not save itself from Sennacherib. For all of Sennacherib's wisdom, the king of Assyria, he could not reckon with the fact that in turning to the Lord God, Judah would be delivered from his hand. He sat there and he mocked God and he mocked Hezekiah and he warned the people of Jerusalem. And this is what he said. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the, king, into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not let Hezekiah convince you. Do not listen to him. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, and each one of you of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink of the water of his own system, cistern. Do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his hand out of the, out of the hand of the king of Assyria? But as Hezekiah's actions showed, by turning to the Lord and in accordance with the wisdom of God, Sennacherib, Sennacherib and his armies perished. It was in accordance with the wisdom of God that Sennacherib and his armies did not know God through their wisdom or, for, or through their reason. Simply because no other gods had delivered any of the other nations did not mean that Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would let his people perish. So he saved those who did believe when, Isaiah, when Hezekiah called upon the Lord and confessed this. Truly, O Lord, o Lord the kings of Assyria have laid waste to the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. They were destroyed. So now, O Lord God, save us please from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are Lord. You alone are our God. So God works. God works when the way of his salvation breaches all worldly convention. When all the military tactics... When all the collected resources of the scribes, the debaters, and the wise men of the ages fall short, God's wisdom shows their wisdom to be both foolish and ineffective. When everyone else thought it unreasonable and silly to worship an invisible God rather than one made with hands, Hezekiah found deliverance simply in calling on the name of the Lord. This is the way that God operates, and it pleases him then to render foolish the wisdom of the world through a message whose content, despite human inclination, despite human reason, seems foolish except to those who trust him. And he does indeed save. But what exactly is man's method? What is wrong with it? And why is it incapable of grasping at and understanding the wisdom of God? What's so deficient about the evaluative methods of mankind? Well, God has intended that the message of the cross of Christ crucified is the means through which he brings faith to the elect. Now, Thomas Boston notes, one of my favorite authors, in the, in the preface to The Marrow of Modern Divinity, 
that if all the rationalists, if all the wise men, if all the philosophers in every age got together and tried to figure out how God would save them, they would never arrive at that which God in His infinite wisdom has ordained to pass for salvation. They would indeed, he concludes, reject His plan with disdain. And this is exactly what we see in our passage with the Greeks and the Jews. Here's why their methodologies are deficient. Jews demanded signs that displayed the power of the one claiming to be the Messiah. This was accompanied then with a growing acclamation of military power resulting in the restoration of the Davidic throne. But there was no such thing as a crucified Messiah. A crucified Messiah was a failed Messiah. Moreover, for the Jews, whose scribes were experts in the law, their association with Deuteronomy 21-23 would have come very quickly. In that passage, one hanging on a tree was accursed, and, would have, and they would have immediately made that connection. Jesus was accursed by God, deserving of revulsion, because he hung on a tree. So no matter how many signs that Jesus did, no matter how many signs the apostle perform, apostles performed to verify their message, it was not enough to correspond with the Jewish expectation of the Messiah. They wanted power and signs like none other. And despite what Christ did before them and his apostles did before them, it was never enough. So Jesus crucified was no Messiah at all because he didn't give them what they wanted. What about to Romans? Well, to Romans, crucifixion was the, one of the most gruesome deaths that one can suffer. It was reserved for political insubordination and, and one of the most vile and cruel punishments that anyone could endure. You wouldn't even talk about it in polite company. If you were invited to the, house, the, the mansion of the queen, wherever it is over in England, it would be improper to speak of crucifixion. So to assume that Christ died as a slave and a political martyr was not what to assume that Christ, the one who died as a slave and a political martyr, was now the risen Lord of glory in whom salvation was found was patent nonsense to the Romans. It made absolutely no, no sense. It was nonsensical. And as for Greeks, the idea of the divine had to correlate with the light of wisdom and reason. So the search for wisdom in the divine was a cultural value that was deeply boiled into Greek blood. Their philosophical and religious habit was to conceive of God as ultimate reason, meaning, of course, what we deem reasonable. So how could then, from the Greek perception, a crucified God save others when he was powerless to save himself? They would have thought it was savage and naive. Moreover, for this culture, the goal was disembodiment. To escape the body, not death and then reanimation and resurrection. So a message of Christ crucified necessitates a so-called God who could come back in this weak flesh. How did that correspond with their philosophical and religious values? And so the message itself presented as Paul presents it, undressed in fancy clothing, serves then not just as a stumbling block to Jews, and, but also folly to the Gentiles. And much more than this, I think it's appropriate to say it is a trap, it is a snare, and it is intended in the wisdom of God to lead to their destruction. It is pure foolishness to them. It stinks in their smell. And so the same word that Paul uses here to describe the Jews' response to it, a stumbling block, is the same word that 1 Samuel uses as the trap that Saul set for David using his daughter, daughter Merib, hoping to destroy and undo David. God destroys. He renders nothing the wisdom of the wise. He brings to nothing the expectations of the, of the so-called religious for where and how and when deliverance will come and what that will look like. Yet it has pleased God to preach a, this message of folly that contradicts and stupefies the wisdom of the Greeks and the expectations of the Jews. And what is this message exactly, people of God? Paul says it's Christ crucified. That's it. That's all. Christ crucified. That's what saves. But now we have a dilemma. 
We've said that, there, that we are passive agents who respond to the content of this undressed, unwise, and rhetorically drained message. We've said it is according to God's good pleasure to work through a message that appears foolish and unappealing, that goes against the conventions of both the Greeks and the Romans. We've said that God's wisdom is foolishness in a worldly evaluative system. We've shown how man's method is ultimately incapable of understanding the message of Christ crucified. So what makes people believe this message and go against their normative instincts and evaluative systems in response to this message of Christ crucified? What makes them believe it? Verse 24 gives us the answer. Paul thunders across in almighty contrast. But to those who are being called, those who are elect, to both Greeks and Jews, it is the power and the wisdom of God. So, does it matter if you're Greek or Jew? No. What matters is God's sovereign pleasure in his message to stupefy the world and to bring to faith only those whom he has called. You can't get any clearer on the doctrine of election. Who has the power to understand this message? Is man capable when looking through the lens of worldly conventions? No. He depends completely and entirely on God to call him, to give him eyes to see and ears to hear. And that message from this text, by the way, is loud and clear. Nothing in my hands I bring save spiritual blindness incapable of grasping the message of the cross. Simply to thy cross I cling then. Paul is really then contrasting the reality of God's saving power against the wisdom of the, of the world. To one group, it is folly, and to the other, it is salvation. You will find salvation nowhere else. Nowhere else, in no other message, in no other vice. And I think in our day and age, this is a message that we need to hear. Our world is not so different from the ancient context of rhetorical prowess and wise ideas. The concept of a son who is cosmically punished by a father, foolishness to the feminist community. The concept of a man who was raised from the dead that we put our faith in, incredulous to our scientific world. Show me proof of God. Show me proof he was raised. They might fire back. A singular truth by which all men might be saved that eradicates every other religion, bigotry. A message that promises to save apart from work that we do, no way, Jose. We want the credit, say, say the moralists. And what about worldly promises of salvation? I wasn't able to find any sociological studies on this yet, but I don't think I'm wrong. Political pundits whose ideas can perhaps, like these speech, open the eyes of the populace and keep them from destroying the West. Prager U, Daily Wire, won't find salvation there. Never before have free thinkers been so lauded in our culture that perhaps by sharing their podcast with our friends we might be delivered from the, the, the destructive ideologies of our world. And what's Paul's answer to that? There is no salvation under, under any other name in heaven or on earth than that of Christ crucified. And why is that? Well, Paul lists one singular reason. The supremacy of God. And Paul states it in a paradox. How can what is foolish of God be considered wiser than man? How can what is weak in God be considered mightier than man? Because God's methods have shown themselves to be effective. And man's methods have shown themselves to be ineffective. No amount of wisdom would have delivered Hezekiah and Jerusalem from Sennacherib. No amount of wisdom would have delivered Rome from the Gauls. And no number of signs would have satisfied the Jews or offered a salvation comparable to what Christ offered. Not only has God then proven throughout history, as Paul's quotation of Isaiah shows, that he can actually save despite the wisdom others would offer as counsel, but he's also proven that no amount of wisdom, cunning, craftiness, power, or might can ever do anything but lead to destruction apart from 
his wisdom. So the wisest that man has to offer comes nowhere near the wisdom of God. The mightiest that man has to offer comes nowhere near the might of God. I think that's an interesting one to believe, to think on. Don't believe me? Can man, ha can man exercise some power mightier than God's to save? Less than 100 years later, I think, after World War II, The world has remained on the brink of world war, and at any moment it is just as capable as it was 100 years ago of blowing itself to bits. No amount of power in an atom bomb can deliver mankind from himself. Nothing is capable of, of saving apart from Christ crucified. And now Paul's ultimate reason, his ultimate justification for why things are the way they are is given through the evaluative methods of the world, such that he can call the wisdom of God foolishness and the power of God weakness. When we look at the might of God, when we look at the wisdom of God through the wisdom of the world and through the power of the world, we will only ever come to see it as weakness and as folly. But Christ, is, Christ crucified is the power and he is the wisdom of God because it is in Christ Jesus that salvation actually happens. And this really highlights for us two things. First, our dependence on God for His electing, his electing grace to call us to Himself and His pleasure in doing so. And secondly, the beauty of the cross and our dependence on that message week in and week out to deliver us. And I think this is why, by the way, people love Reformed preaching so much. That's what's different about faithful biblical preaching. There is no semblance of seduction of, of the rhetorical devices of the world trying to tickle your ears. We're not trying to sell you on a product that can make your life better. We're not trying to seduce you with signs and wonders or pithy sayings that might improve your life like a TED Talk. We're not offering you moralistic therapeutic deism. We're offering before you and laying before you Christ crucified to reconcile sinners to God as a result of God's free electing grace. What good is that then, the world would say for me? How can that comfort me? Surely the Corinthians would have asked the same question as they expected more glory for life in the present. Surely we can resonate with that too then, can't we? When we look around the world, when we recognize that we're preaching a gospel that's supposed to save and we meet in a small room. When more and more the message of the cross is unpopular. Why isn't there more glory now? Well, the simple answer is that the, the message and faith in it does not yield glory in the present. It leads us to suffer unexpectedly for the sake of Christ, to build up what is lacking in his own suffering, to stand for a message that the world thinks is foolish, that the world thinks is weak. And yet simultaneously, despite how foolish it looks to our world, despite the present sufferings that would otherwise indicate a weak, non-existent God, there is no other place where the people of God can come to for healing. There is no other place where the people of God who have thus been called can come to be encouraged, built up, strengthened, or girded up with wisdom and the power of God than where Christ crucified is proclaimed to the ends of the earth. So here then, in worship, we come to hear him who was crucified speak tenderly to us. Come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you have been called, you have been saved by him who laid down his own life in order to take upon himself the greatest dilemma that man would ever experience. It was not judgment and destruction from Assyria or Babylon. It was judgment for sin by the Almighty God. And yet the Father sent His Son that you and I might depend on that foolish and weak Savior who died on a cursed cross. And so we exclaim, what a beautifully foolish and weak message it is, in the words of Paul. And yet it is the only message that saves. 
V's message has no power to deliver society from tyranny. Tyranny is sin and death, and the only solution is him who gave himself over to death and yet could not be bound by it. And so we come and we feast not just once, but twice every Sunday on that proclamation. It's not family day. It's not fun day. It's not time to go to the theaters, do some yard work, binge watch a TV show, or get some well-deserved R&R. It's a day that we come to have Christ himself held forth to us in insurmountable power. He is the power of God made known most fully in this dusty age. He is the wisdom of God most brilliantly that shines in this dark age. And we come to hear and hold him and the promise of his rest where he is proclaimed in truth and in power. No other vice, no other power is mighty to save in the way that God has been pleased to save through his son, Christ Jesus. And he has demonstrated most fully on the cross his saving power in Christ Jesus. And so it was in John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress that when Christian came up to the cross and his burdens rolled away, he exclaimed this, Thus far did I come laden with my sin, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in, till I came here. What a place is this? Must here be the beginning of my bliss. Must here the burden fall from my back. Must here the strings that bound it to me crack. Blessed cross, blessed sepul sepulcher, blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. Father, when all other worldly comforts are found weak, are found indeed powerless, we cling to you, not because we have seen fit by our own evaluations, but because you have called us to yourself. And so we call out to you as Hezekiah did, save us please from the hand of our enemies, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God alone. Amen.